Hey, welcome to Crossroads Online. My name is Roy Cervantes and I serve as the worship pastor here at Crossroads Church. We believe in bringing a real God to real people through community and that the church is more than just a building, but a group of people that are walking together and trusting Jesus every step of the way. Because of that, we're so glad that you decided to tap into our online resources, but this should in no way be a substitution from your involvement in the local church. I believe that God can speak directly to you and impact your life through this online message, but every single time he says, go and be a part of my church. There are a lot of things going on in the life of our church. Take a look around, and we hope that you enjoy this message. Welcome to Crossroads Church. My name is Marcus, and um, lead pastor here, and welcome to our new series entitled The Bottom of the Ninth. It's obviously a baseball theme, and so we want to encourage you throughout the whole uh, month to bring your favorite jersey, bring it, or put it on, put on your favorite jersey, and just, um, we'll challenge you guys to uh, an arm wrestling or something, I'm not sure, we'll do, we'll do something, but how many guys remember, I'm going to give you a little trivia real quick, how many guys remember a guy by the name of Alex Bregman? One person, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I, we're going we're gonna to talk about him in just a, a few minutes, because I think that you're going to find out that you and I have something in common with this gentleman, and we'll look at him in just a second. But I was thinking about this um, one little guy. I don't know about you, but I don't know. I'm going to pick one of these balls. It's soft, okay, just in case I hit it. <clears throat> um, there was this one. Whenever I was a kid, I used to play baseball. I used to love playing baseball. And anybody here with me? One person? Good. Three, three guys. <laughs> what did y'all do? <laughs> Um, you guys were hood rats, weren't y'all? <laughs> but well, I used to love playing baseball, and I always had these scenarios in my head. I was always, you know, you know, third, you know, bottom of the ninth, you know, and I'm at bat, and I'm going to hit the home run, grand slam, and all that kind of stuff. I was a pitcher, and I also played shortstop. <clears throat> and I always do the same scenario with the pitching as well. I'm like, man, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. You know, I, I used to throw a knuckleball and a curveball, and, and I, would, I would sit there with my bat and glove and ball, and I would just walk around the house, because I didn't, back then, we didn't have uh, games like you guys have. My dad said, here's a ball. We have a brick wall outside that we built the house on. Just throw it against the brick wall. That's, that's your game. So I was like, okay, dad. <laughs> so that's what we did. And, uh, but I remember playing scenarios in my head. It's like I would pitch. I was like, man, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. And I would throw, throw a strike, and I would throw it. And I would imagine, it's like, and the guy would swing, strike one. I'm like, yeah, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. And I'd be like throwing a curveball. I said, I'm going to throw him a curveball this time. So I'd, you know, I would rev up and, and I would throw it. And I'd see a curveball and the dude would swing like strike two. I said, man, I'm going to throw the heat this time. And I would throw the heat. And sure enough, I'd, I'd get it and the guy would get it. And boom, oh, man. I'd be like, I accidentally would hit it every now and then. And I'd be like, man, wh- I'm the greatest hitter in the world. <laughs> That's the greatest picture, right? So you'd play all these crazy scenarios in your head as you were, um, as I was playing Little League and what have you. But this series is, is, is a baseball theme, and I want to begin with this question. Have you guys ever felt, uh, fell behind in an area of your life? Like you, you fell behind in an area, maybe in, in the area of your finances, uh, maybe, maybe it was your, your rent. You ever been behind in your rent? Man, a bunch of hands going up. Uh, how many of you guys have ever fell behind in your utilities? Uh, you know, you should have been further ahead in life in an area, maybe in your college or your degree or something, but uh, looking at your colleagues and friends, you're way, way behind. Or in an area of your relationships or an area emotionally. Anybody been there? How about your to-do list with your wife? Always. Oh, you're always. <laughs> for, for some of us... For some of us, it's like the score is 27 to 4 or something, right, when it comes to the areas of our to-do list. Well, the reality of it that is in this room, there's probably um, several of us here that are in be- behind in one area or another, right? And I don't know about you, but whenever I get behind, uh, specifically in the areas having to do with my marriage or my wife or people that are close to me, there's an emotion that comes up um, that you can probably all identify with, and that's this emotion, that we feel down and out, right? It's like, man, I owe my brother, 
fifty bucks, and I, I, you know, it should have been done two months ago, and there he is at Walmart. I, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go somewhere else, or whatever. <laughs> but this is an emotion that we can totally all identify. As. Actually, the scripture says that hope deferred makes the heart sick, right? We, we feel down and out. These are what we're gonna call in this series bottom of the ninth moments, okay? And I'm going to teach the first two. Pastor Joel is going to be teaching the last two in this series. But here's what I want you to understand, uh, that in baseball, the bottom of the ninth never happens unless you are uh, in the home, the home team. And if you're, in the home, if you're the home team and you get to the bottom of the ninth, something has happened. You're either behind or you either have a tied ball game. And so it's never really fun. There's always a, a certain amount of tension that takes place. It's a struggle that's taking place at the bottom of the ninth, right? It's highly stressful in those situations. And here's what we're going to discover in this particular series, that you may feel like you're down, but you're never out, okay? You might be down in the area that you're falling behind in right now, but I want to encourage you and I want to give you hope for your future that you're never out. It ain't over till it's over. And everybody, all the Presbyterians said, amen. amen. Okay. There's still hope. And here's what I want you to understand also is that God, your God, the God of this Bible that we find right here, God specializes in bottom of the ninth moments throughout all of Scripture. Abraham and Isaac, he comes through at the bottom of the ninth. Daniel in the lion's den, he comes through in the bottom of the night. Shadmac, 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 that dude, those guys, Meshach and Abednego, he comes through in the bottom of the night. Over and over, the woman with the issue of blood, Mark the fifth chapter, he comes through in the bottom of the night, right? The scripture goes on to say, he goes, man, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will be with you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He goes on to say, he goes, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Bottom of the ninth, you might be down, you might feel down, but you're never out. I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. It says, you might be pressed down by every trouble, but you're not crushed. You might be perplexed, but you're not in despair. You might be hunted down, but you're never going to be abandoned by your God. You and I might feel like we're down in the area of what we just talked about here in a second, but we're never out. You can never quit. It was game five, 2017, in the World Series, and the series is tied two to two. And we're about to go into the top of the ninth inning, and the Astros are winning nine to 12. Anybody remember that? 2017. That was just a few months ago. One person back there, uh, Roy's wife, May. <laughs> Dodgers are a rally, though, to score three runs. All they had to do was just get these guys out. But they rallied to score three runs, and they tie the game 12-12. to Now it's the bottom of the ninth. The Astros, they fall short, and they get out. So they're going to have to go into the 10th inning, and uh, the Astros strike everybody. I mean, everybody's out. And so now it's the bottom of the 10th, and Minute Maid Park is going crazy. Like, ah. Everybody do that, ah. Yeah, that's exactly how it sounded. <laughs> the pitcher of the Dodgers, Kenley Jansen, he's one of the best closers in baseball. Jansen retires the first two batters of the Astros, and then um, he hits the next batter, and then he walks the next batter. So it's two outs, two guys on base, and out of all the people who's going to bat, they pick this guy by the name of Alec, uh, what's his name? Berkman. <laughs> He's a rookie. I'm like, are you serious? Come on. Hire somebody in that moment. <laughs> right? And so, anybody remember that moment? I'm not going to tell it to you. I want you to draw your attention to the screen. We put it on the screen for you just so you can relive it. Thank you. Bregman would like to get him to scamper home. Two on, two out. Ten Bennett. That's in the air to left. Here comes Fisher. Come on, you guys got to yell at it. Oh, yes. In 10. I just won $200. <laughs> right? Who is this guy? Alex Bergman. In the beginning of the season, this young third baseman, he was the rookie 
Uh, he was a rookie in that particular season. And at the end of the season, you know, he became, he's the one that kind of led the Astros uh, to win their first pennant, the World Series. So it was powerful. But one of the things that I found in common with Alex is something that I find um, common in my life and in, in your life. When you were listening to his interview, in several cases, he interviewed several times, but one of the things that he said is that he had, he had hope. There was an expectation. He, he said, if, if the first two of the guys that were before him, if they don't score, he goes, it, it's going to be my opportunity and I can win this game. He might, it might have been down and out, and he might have been tight and nervous, but there was an expectation and there was a hope that took place in this man's mindset. And, I, and, I, and I'm telling you the same way. You might feel you're way behind in the area of your marriage or whatever situation you're facing in life, but I want you to understand something. You and I have to have hope in order to get to the other side. We have to have hope in our lives, amen? And so uh, this morning, I want to share with you a story that we find in Matthew's gospel. You should get some notes. You should have had to connect and it's a story, and this story is going to introduce you to the greatest source of all of our hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we, we, we look at this scenario. One day, Jesus is walking along, and he gets approached by this rich young ruler. This rich young ruler comes up to him. He asks him a question. He goes, hey, good teacher, what must I do so that I can inherit eternal life? And Jesus turns around, he goes, good, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and that is God alone. He goes, but you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall honor your father and mother, you shall not bear false witness, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young ruler said, goes, man, he goes, awesome. He didn't say awesome, but he says, I, I've been doing that. He goes, I've been doing that since I was a kid. And so Jesus' response to that statement, Jesus says this, he goes, man, if, then if you want to be perfect, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and there you're going to have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler responded how maybe perhaps some of us would have responded. It says that he went away sorrowful because he had much possessions. And this is where we come in the story in Matthew's gospel in verse 23. And Jesus then turns around and he says something to the disciples. He says, surely I say unto you that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's hard for a rich man to enter. Now, you might think that, that he's talking about um, people that are getting distracted with the riches. And yes, there's the glitter of this world that has a tendency to entice us and pull us away. But the context of this particular conversation is not necessarily addressing to, to riches. He's, he's addressing the topic of salvation. He's addressing the topic of how do I get to heaven? How can I get saved? How do I get to our heavenly father? And that's the question many of us have in life and the people that we rub shoulders with. It's like, am I good enough to get to heaven? And, and then he says, he says this, again, I say unto you, Jesus goes on, he goes, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I've, I can't even put a thread through a needle, right? He says it's, it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man or any man to get to heaven in other words, he's saying, it's the bottom of the ninth, and in this situation, you're way behind. You're like 778 to zero. It's impossible for you to get and enter into the kingdom of God. And then in verse 25, he goes on to say, when the disciples thought about that statement, he goes, well then, greatly astonished, the disciples said, who can, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? When it comes to your salvation and my salvation, every single one of us are in the bottom of the ninth, aren't we? It's, it's the greatest opportunity that you're facing right now is not necessarily the greatest opportunity you've ever faced right now. The greatest impossibility 
that you have ever faced is the impossibility of connecting with your Heavenly Father and uh, living forever and being at peace with your Heavenly Father. We're way behind in that topic. We're separated from a holy God. The scripture says that all of our goodness and all of our greatest things that we've ever done is like filthy rags to our Heavenly Father. It's impossible. That's a bottom of the ninth moment in that scenario. And it was impossible to connect and answer that question where they feel like, oh, I can do this to enter into God's kingdom. You've got to be better than an eye, a camel going through the eye of a needle. And so Jesus goes on to say, well, then Jesus looked at him and said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Amen? That's good news. The good news is that when they didn't understand exactly how that was going to take place. They didn't understand that Jesus was going to become the sacrificial lamb that would make a way so that they could enter into this place called the kingdom of heaven. They were so far behind. It's like, man, well, then how can we get there? And they had to explain that to him uh, through action in just a few scenes later. <coughs> Growing up, we didn't have this thing that today they call the mercy rule. Um, growing up, if we had a good offensive team, it was a pleasure to beat them 47 to 1. They'd be like, come on, let's rack this thing up. Let's have some batting practice. Everybody go around. Then after everybody goes around, we'll just hit it to the, on the left, get on the left side and hit it. And, you know, then we'll get out and then come back and do that again. And the other team's suffering and, you know, they're having, they're having a bad day. Anybody ever been there? Anybody used to rack up the points like that? Yes. It was fun doing that, wasn't it? Unless you were on the other side of it. Like, come on, guys, really? You know? Well, I guess somebody high up, you know, maybe it was the Holy Spirit, somebody high up said, let's introduce this mercy rule to the United States of America. And so the mercy rule says this. It says that after the second or third inning, if you're 10 runs ahead, uh, then the game's over. Okay? Boo. So we have a we have a crossroads church that has we have a softball team and I was asking the the guys that were on the team earlier in the first service it's like hey uh, how are you guys doing how's the, what's the record have y'all won a game yet and they're like no but we we've come close is that good enough I was like no it's not good <laughs> no it's not good enough um, because it's like what time is y'all's game well it's at seven o'clock it was a it's seven twenty y'all guys are at the pizza hut already drinking a beer <laughs> the mercy rule was in in place. <laughs> No, it wasn't that bad. But that's, that's, the, that's the mercy rule. And so the mercy rule, God's version of the mercy rule goes something like this. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That was the mercy rule. He could have run ruled you. He could have run ruled us and just made us look, just crush us so that we're forever separated from our Heavenly Father. But he put a mercy rule intact. And that mercy rule came in the form of, of his son. Jesus becomes the mercy seat for every single one of us. Jesus steps up to the plate and he hits a home run on our behalf. Jesus comes and steps up to the plate and he becomes a sacrificial bunt so that you and I could be advanced to good things in this life and in the life to come. That's who he is for us. Amen? And here's what that means to me. And I'm hoping that this is what it means to you. That you may be down, but you're never out. You're never out, period. If, 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 if God the Father was able to bring Jesus back up from the grave... He can bring your situation that you're behind in right now out of the grave and into a good place. Amen? That's the hope that you have because of what Christ has done. Regardless of what you're facing this morning, if it's in the area of your marriage or your business or whatever that is, you might feel way behind, but I want you to understand that the game ain't over yet. And if he could raise Christ from the grave, he can raise your situation from the grave. And you will be in a better place in the near future.
That's my hope for you. Amen. And so this morning, I want to leave you with four words today. And on your way out, you're going to receive a little card. Um, I thought I had it here, but I don't. <clears throat> Did I drop it? Oh. Ow. My back just went out. Um, this little card, and, and there's four words on there. It's taken from this passage of Scripture in John 3. And, and the four words is this. Anything is possible, people. Anything is possible. So you take this, you put this, I don't know, tattoo it, do something, put it on your shirt, put it on your refrigerator, and just re a reminder that, listen, anything is possible. You and I need to be anything is possible people. Amen? Can't get discouraged where you're at right now. Your child, yes, he might be 10 years, you know, relapsing or doing all these crazy shenanigans, but I want you to understand there's still hope. It's not over yet. Anything is possible if you just believe. Amen? There's still hope. I shared this story with you guys a few times in the last 11 or 12 years, and I want to share it again because it's just so branded in my head. And I'll close with this story. I used to coach, um, what do you call it, uh, Little League, Girls League, All-Stars, Select Fast Pitch. I used to have three or four teams. <coughs> Early when I started, I used to coach my daughters when they were, what, how, what age, babe, seven, eight years old? Seven or eight years old. And they gave me my first team. And I felt, I felt awesome. I felt like Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> I look like Tommy Lasorda now. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, let me get sidetracked. Let me get focused here. So, so, so I'm a brand new coach. <laughs> and they, you know what they do to new coaches, right? They give them, they give them all, the burned play, all the players that aren't really that good or the new people that are coming in. And so I got all these little hood rats, you know, on my team. And it was fun. I was like, man, you know what? I'm going to make the best of this day. I've got my daughter here. We're just going to make the best of this season. And so we, we were behind in every stat possible that particular year. I mean, we're talking about we were behind in runs scored. We were behind in everything. The only thing we won is, is that we won. We had the most losses in the whole season. That's the, that's the thing that we wanted. And, uh, but there's this one little girl named Sarah, little Sarah, beautiful little blonde-headed little girl, but she was the shortest one, but she was so optimistic, always optimistic, and she was like, in, you know, in shape. And um, unfortunately, though, any bat that we would find, it was always way bigger than little Sarah. We couldn't find the bat, so we would try to coach her how to, how to bat, and we'd have to get the timing down because it, it would, she'd have to just, you know, go way around before the pitch would come. So we'd say... Before he releases the pitch, start swinging. You'll get there eventually, right? And we, the whole season, week after week, she would never be able to hit. And so it became our challenge and our goal that by the end of the season, Sarah's going to hit the ball. <laughs> and uh, we would just keep practicing and keep practicing with it and stuff. So last game of the season, Sarah still has not gotten a hit yet two outs, and it's bottom of the, wasn't the ninth, because we didn't play that long. It's maybe bottom of the fifth or whatever. And who's up to bat? Little Sarah. Sarah comes up to bat. <laughs> and um, strike one. The pitch comes. And she's still optimistic. She's like smiling. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Pitcher pitches again. She swings. Strike two. Because that's okay. And so the pitch three comes in, and Sarah hits the ball. And she's like, everybody's going crazy. All the parents are going crazy. Sarah, Sarah's going crazy. And we forgot to, we were so focused on her hitting the ball, we never told her where to run. <laughs> so she's just, just, she takes off to third base. She's just running. Like, no, Sarah, go this way. But, man, that was the last game of the season. And we were so proud of little Sarah. And I'm hoping that that same scenario happens in your life. She never quit. She was always optimistic. And all of a sudden, that one day, it all came together and she hit the ball. And I'm believing in your life, in your marriage or business or whatever that is, that you're going to hit a home run, that you're going to get a hit. You might not know what the heck to do afterwards. 
<laughs> but it's going to be something that you've never done before. But God's going to get you on the other side. So I, I put on your notes three points, three action points that I want you to think about as we enter into this series and go next week and the next two or three weeks. I really encourage you to do, number one, select one area, one area in your life that you're behind. Be honest with yourself. What are you behind in? What have you fallen behind in? What have you discouraged about? Select one area and then step up to the plate. And I want you to step up to the plate by number two, coming back next Sunday and coming back the next three Sundays. As a matter of fact, you can even add this. Come back the next couple Sundays and bring somebody with you. And just, I don't know, entice them somehow. Bring a carrot, buy them lunch. And just say, you know what? Something's going on this month at our church. I want you to come and, and, and partner with me and sit with me. I, wanna, I, I want you to get encouraged by the scriptures this month and uh, invite them to come. But come back next Sunday. And then the third one is this. Is I want Now, this is the most challenging one. I want you to allow us to pray for you, okay? You know, we, we get prayer requests all the time. And people come up to us all the time and they say, hey, can you pray for me? This is what's going on. I, and I wonder how many times we, we really pray for people. And so this morning, here's what I want to do. Um, you know what that one situation is. You know what that one scenario is. You know what you're way behind in. And I want to pray for you this morning right here in this church before you leave. Okay? So if you're here this morning and you, you, file, you find yourself behind in something, can you just lift up your hand real high? Don't be ashamed. Yes, thank you. So, oh, that's awesome. All right, let's all stand real quick. Okay, guys, listen, I want you, this is a family here. I want you, those of you who you find yourself falling behind, I want you to lift up your hand real high. And for the rest of us, look around you. Look around you. Now, I want you to walk next to a person whose hand is lifted up. And I just want you to lay your hand on their shoulder and just pray for them, okay? I just want you to pray for them. Don't let one person whose hand is up be left alone. Just, just walk around. There's some more hands right here. And I just want you to pray. You don't have to wait for me. Just go ahead and pray. There's a hand back there. There's a hand back there. There's a hand back here, right here in front. Okay, you got it? Let's pray together. Father, you're so good to us. And Father, those that have lifted up their hand, thank you for, thank you for their courage. Uh, you alone, Master, know uh, what they're facing. And I'm asking you, sir, to intervene on their behalf. Close the doors that need to be closed. Open the doors that need to be open. And may your favor surround them. May you go before them. May you open that door for them so that they can walk in. And they'll know that it was only your hand, God. It was only your hand that helped them get to that place. Lord, heal those that need to be healed. Touch those that need to be touched, Master. And we just thank you that um, week after week, Father, as they come, they'll be encouraged, that there'll be hope for their future, and that you will get them out of this place where they are in alignment with your perfect will. So we just commit them and we declare your lordship over their life today in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for doing that. We love you guys. Hey, listen, come back next week. We appreciate you so very much. We'll see you next Sunday. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. If you would like to give toward our ministry to see more resources put out online, check out crossroadc.com backslash giving. And don't forget, we have three services on Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. Hope to see you there.